there's always a grandparent in the audience who will raise their hand and say, but my child is doing X, Y, and Z wrong, and I have to step in. That when you're a parent, you're always worried about your kids. When you're a grandparent, you start worrying about even more people. So we are blessed today with more information, more research, more data. We now know more than we did 30 years ago. We now know that a child's uh, digestive system isn't developmentally ready for solid food until cl much closer to six months old. When I was a baby, my parents started feeding me solids when I was two months old. Sharon Maisel, the brilliant mind behind Bite Size Parenting, is here with us today. As a leading parenting expert, Sharon's wisdom and practical tips have empowered countless families. Sharon has become a go-to resource for anyone looking to build a happier, healthier family. Children will have better emotional and social and academic and behavioral outcomes when they have fathers who are involved. I think where I'm from, it's still the same old times when dads are not participating. I think so. You realize what you're missing out on. I mean, you are missing out on some of the happiest times that you will possibly ever have. Changes, bodily changes that are happening to mothers are also happening in a different way, but also happening to fathers. So that should um, boost up confidence, just knowing that, uh, that, that there's, there's some help. Men's levels of testosterone actually and you guys may not like hearing this. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Sharon, welcome back. It's been almost a year since we last spoke. I'm so glad to see you guys again, to talk with you guys. Yeah, thank you so much for coming back for episode two. You know, I kind of wanted to start off our conversation with a very optimistic point of view here. Uh, I'm a millennial. Uh, I'm 31 years old for context for those who are listening. And I'm particularly very happy with our generation. The, the men that I see in general that are traditionally much more involved in taking care of their child compared to just a generation ago. Uh, in fact, there was a recent uh, Pew report that came out stating that young fathers have nearly tripled their time with their children since 1965. So it looks like we're going on this great trend. And I see, you know, a couple of my friends also have kids. I have kids. Vlad has uh, uh, two daughters. And I really do see the men involved. You know, when we think about when I think about my father, you know, there's almost no involvement, <laughs> and I think that's you know you, that's that that was a common thing for the last generation. So my my first question to you is for those who are listening, who who has a child on the way, or perhaps already has a child, preferably a young child, what advice do you have for those fathers who who are a little bit more hesitant, or who want to be more involved? in the child care aspects or raising their child, but they feel less confident or capable than the mothers in this case? It, it's a great question. You're right. It's very timely because more and more dads are more and more involved. I, I think that um, when it comes to confidence, it's sort of like it feeds on itself. The more you do, the more confident you feel. And then because you realize, hey, I can do this. So I feel confident in doing it. And so it makes you feel more confident. And the more confident you are, the stronger the bond you will develop with your child, which in turn will make you feel more motivated to want to develop that bond even more. So it kind of is like this circular type of uh, mentality, right? I can do it. I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to maybe make mistakes along the way. But the more I do it, the better I'll become at it, which will make me more confident um, in it. And, and I think that's a great message for all parents, moms and dads, that parenting is just trying. It's a learning curve. Moms, actually, women are not born mothers, necessarily. They also have to learn on the job. And yes, you know, um, moms, mothers will have some more physical things happen to their bodies if they're pregnant, if they're breastfeeding. They will have those nurturing hormones that occur naturally for them. But the truth is, is that studies uh, interestingly show that men have the same kind of changes. Obviously, they're not um, you know, physically delivering the baby. Um, but they actually have studies show that men, and you guys may not like hearing this, but <laughs> men's levels of testosterone actually um, 
uh, decrease around the time of the birth of a baby. Now, it, it's I know it sounds a little frightening, <laughs> right? It's a little decrease in testosterone. But that decrease in testosterone actually allows for an increase in some of those bonding hormones, the oxytocin and the dopamine, that allows and enables dads to, to feel more nurturing, to feel more connected in the same way that moms do because their levels of hormones are also changing and their oxytocin levels are increasing. So at, men actually have that physical change that the, in the same way that me, women do, obviously slightly different, but uh, in an equal measure. Um, the other interesting thing about those kind of body changes is that um, in men, studies have shown that the brain changes as well. It's not just hormone changes, but wow. the areas of the brain that are um, associated with attachment and nurturing and caring and empathy and the ability to understand a child, what a, ch uh, what a baby is trying to communicate, all those areas in, in a dad's brain plump up after the birth of a baby. And they've shown this in, you know, through MRI studies and, and other um, technology that actually shows these changes in um, a father's brain. And so, you, you know, you said that, um, you know, how, what do men do to feel, how can they feel more confident? How can fathers feel more confident? Well, just know that your bodies are made for this in a way, that, that the same kind of uh, 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 changes, bodily changes that are happening to mothers are also happening in a different way, but also happening to fathers. So that should um, boost up confidence, just knowing that, uh, that, that there's, there's some help. It's not just, you know, what I have to do. A and I think it's important, finally, for men to remember or, or to not underestimate the importance of fathers in their children's lives. And that, I think, will help increase their confidence. Study after study has shown that a father's involvement in their child's life, and it's not about number of hours, it's about quality of the, that mm -hmm. engagement and interaction, um, really has very uh, uh, direct, positive uh, outcomes for the child, whether it's health, fathers who are involved um, with, with their babies, their higher rates of breastfeeding for the mothers, um, there's better weight gain in preterm infants. All these studies show this again and again. Um, children will have better emotional and social and um, academic and behavioral outcomes when they have fathers who are involved. Uh, when it comes to adolescence, fathers who are involved, they're, um, that they they're, they're engage in less risky behavior, those children. Mm. So the importance of fathers is very unique and, um, and special. And that's something that really fathers can do that mothers maybe can't or that they can't do uh, alone or they, you know, that, that, that there really is a lot of value in fa uh, paternal involvement. And so um, that should alone give, um, give dads confidence and feeling I'm just as capable. I can work hard at it just the same way that, you know, other parents can and do. And, um, and, my, and what I do as a parent really has positive outcomes. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. And I do you know when you was reading this research, was it done just in the U.S. or the worldwide? That no, it was worldwide. Worldwide. It was worldwide. Yes, yes. There's a lot of studies. No, I mean the studies oh, that sorry. shows you're that speaking about that. Uh, you're the more that more men are interested in, uh, in spending yeah. much more time with their kids. If it was a U, that was a U.S. study, uh, but that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure what it looks like uh, in different countries. Um, I think where I'm from, it's still the same all times when dads are not participating. I think you don't so. think there's been a minor improvement or, I mean, even if it's a 5% improvement, I mean, statistically speaking, I mean, that you have TikTok, you, I mean, everybody there is, has access to all the media out there as well. I don't think so because judging by my friends, they still mm -hmm. all same like it used to be before, not like here. Here, I also see that a lot of men are participating. Even sometimes even more than than uh, than the mother sometimes. The mother. <laughs> well, I mean, I for one think that it's almost criminal not to participate in raising your child. Not because I think you have an obligation to. I mean, obviously you do, but 
I don't think you realize what you're missing out on. I mean, you are missing out on some of the happiest times that you can possibly, and you will possibly ever have. I mean, it, I, and I've just gone through this and I have a nine month old daughter and I mean, it's, yeah, it's challenging, you know, for the first three months you are sleep deprived and it gets better. It always gets better. You have things in place and you work together, but just the memories and just, you'll, you'll, it's, it's, it's one of the best feelings that you can never understand until you actually have a child. So again, my, my thing is if you're not, if you're a father and you're not experiencing this, I mean, it's pretty bizarre. You're missing out on so much <laughs> happiness. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's the way I see it. And that's the way I feel, uh, I feel about it. Uh, but Sharon, I, I, as we were talking, I, it's, it's, it's funny because, um, we, you know, we're talking about the, the millennials and our, you know, our generation who are more involved and then you have the older generation, like my mom, and it's it's funny because every time, and I can't get past this barrier, I uh, you know I I'll bring my daughter over, we'll go over, and for for my mom, she still thinks that I don't know how to change a diaper. I'm a man. I cannot possibly know how to take care of my child. I cannot possibly know how to feed my child. I cannot possibly know, I don't know how to console my child. You know, one time my daughter was crying, she was crying for five. I I picked her up. My mom said. Give her to me. You're, you're, she literally said, you're a man in her, in her own language. Uh, you're a man. You can't comfort her, uh, which is bizarre. So I suppose my question here is any tips and advice for, to bridge that gap between the older generation, especially for, for I, I'm sure I'm not the first one that, that's experienced this. Uh, any possible advice there on how to get the message across like, hey, I can take care of my own child. I know exactly what to do. Uh, because, you know, I tell my mom, but she's still the same way. You know, she, she can't see the path. She can't get over the fact that I'm a man <laughs> and she, you know, <laughs> she has better instincts. So, you know, I think it's definitely a generational thing as you described and, and Vlad, as you were describing, it's certainly a, um, a, a cultural thing as well. And, um, there are certainly, uh, beyond the U.S. where um, where dads are more involved, certainly in, in, in certain countries in Europe where they're giving fathers a year um, paternity leave at, at yeah. equal to the mothers. So, there, you know, a lot of it is cultural and societal. Um, but uh, so uh, certainly a grandparent who is older and more set in their ways um, and who, who comes from a different cultural background or understanding of what their lives were 30, 40 years ago when they were parents, um, it, it's going to be a hard, um, a hard shift for them to make. And, and I think that, um, through watching you, um, as a parent and seeing that, wait a second, you actually can comfort your, your baby when she's crying. You actually do know what to feed her and how to feed her. She actually does have fun with you in a way that maybe is extra special and different. Um, those kind of repeated, right? She's only nine months old. So in a couple of years, your mother will, I believe, be able to say, you know what, there's a lot of value in what you can provide for your child as a father, even if it's not what I, as the older generation, I'm speaking, in, you know, for your mother, what I am normally used to, what I was used to when I was a young mother. Um, so that, so I think that it's about time. I think it's time. Mm. But you know what, I, and I say this as a grandmother <laughs> myself, um, uh, the, the grandparents are you, sometimes you just got to grin and bear it, and you got to say, okay, whatever you say, mom, and then you do your own thing. But you know what is funny? Grandparents, they even don't allow your child to cry a little bit. Well, when they were parenting us, if we would cry, they would allow, we would cry here and there. I mean, you know, they would give us time. But as soon as grand, grandchild is just crying, right second they are giving them whatever they want. Well, yes, but it depends on the grandparent, right? Again, talking gender, I happen to be a pretty young grandparent, so um, I, I, do, I do let my grandchildren cry, and also I happen to be a parenting expert, so I know, you know, what, what is appropriate to do and what the new research shows and, and what, the, what, what you know, one, the best way, or there is no best way, but a good way of parenting. But um, you, as parents, you're always going to get unsolicited advice, whether it comes from grandparents or from people in the playground or from friends or from sister-in-laws or from uncles, you're always going to get that unsolicited advice. And um, I remind parents uh, again and again that this is your child. You are the expert. Become a well-informed parent by, by following trustworthy sources, whether that's a pediatrician, whether it's 
reading my book, whether it's following trustworthy sources on social media, and then feel confident in yourself as a parent to say, this is what I'm going to do. I know that this is what I should be doing for my child. It feels right for me. It's, it's according to the, the, the latest recommendations. And then, you know, what they're saying doesn't really make sense. So I have a follow up question here. What if you as a uh, as a grandma, you see your children is doing something completely wrong while parenting, but then don't ask you for for your opinion. What would you do? So as a grandparent, <laughs> yeah, no, that never happens. But as a grandparent. And, and I speak to grandparents often. I, I, I give a lot of talks to parent groups, but I also give talks of grandparent groups uh, on a number of topics. And this always comes up. There's, like, there's always a grandparent in the audience who will raise their hand and say, but my child is doing X, Y, and Z wrong, and I have to step in. I have to be that person to set them straight, to tell them how to do it. And I remind the grandparent that you've done a good job as a parent. And if you trust in yourself as a parent, then you've raised your child to be a competent person and presumably a competent parent. And that part of becoming a parent and growing in your role as parent is learning on the job. And so, yeah, you know what? Your child, right, and talking to the grandparent, your child may do things wrong sometimes, and that's okay. And, and the truth is, I say the same thing to parents of little kids, too. It's okay and really helpful to allow your children to make mistakes because then they learn mm. from those mistakes and then they could course correct and become better at whatever it is they're doing. So the same thing for when you're a grandparent, your child, who by the way is an adult, can make mistakes. Obviously, when we're talking about major health or safety issues, yes, step in, tell your child that's not safe for, your, for my grandchild to do. If you know what the latest recommendations are, the latest safety um, rules are. But it doesn't really matter if your child leaves his or her child to cry five minutes longer than what you would have been comfortable doing. Or if your child is now feeding their child uh, in a different way than you did. I, I you know, there's, it, it's such a fascinating topic because grandparents and, and other the older generations will often say, why are you doing it that way? We did it the mm. other way and you turned out okay. Right. That's like right. a constant refrain. But you turned out OK. And what I do when I talk to grandparents and what I remind parents to tell their parents, the grandparents, is that we are blessed today with more information, more research, more data. We now know more than we did 30 years ago. And that's a good thing. So when somebody says, when a grandparent says, well, I did it that way and you turned out OK, that's survivor's bias, because luckily thank goodness, right? The grandparent's child turned out okay. Take, for example, car seats. And when I, when I was uh, 25 years ago, when I was a, a, a parent of a baby, um, we were told to switch the car seat to forward facing as soon as the baby turns one. Now, mm. that was what we knew in those days. But now right. we know, and, and thank God my children turned out fine. But now we have more data, we have more research, and more safety information to know that actually it's much safer for children to be rear-facing till at least two years old, if not longer. And that's not based on because, oh, my kids turned out okay because they were fine when I flipped their car seat forward-facing at a year. But there were other children who weren't fine because right. they were flipped too early. And so it's important to acknowledge, wait, we have more information and that's a good thing. And sometimes it's very hard for grandparents to, to swallow, really. And, and uh, another example might be feeding. The way that we feed children today is very different than the way, even than the way I was fed when I was a baby. My parents started feeding me solids when I was two months old. Wow. Now, right. right it, it seems kind of funny. But in, in the 70s, when I was a baby, that's what the recommendations were. We now know that a child's uh, digestive system isn't developmentally ready for solid food until cl much closer to six months old. So did I turn out okay? Yes, I'm fine. I, I eat well. I love food. But, it, but, who, but we know now that some kids did turn out okay because they were being shoved food in their mouth at two months old, and that wasn't healthy for them. So we have more data now, and it's important for grandparents and anybody else who loves babies to say it's okay that it might look or feel a little different now. 
for the grandchildren, for this generation of young children. Because it's not, um, for most things, it's not like just uh, out of the blue, out of, you know, we're just right. plucking something. Oh, let's try this. Usually it's because there's been more study into these topics and now we know a little more. How old is your grandchild? Um, I have three, actually. Wow. I have, yeah. I have a two a two year old, a almost one year old, and a almost six month old. Wow! Okay, and I, I I remember you had four kids, right? Four four, four children, children. Yes, four I had kids very young. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I had children very young, and my kids are having children very young. So it's actually really um, that's incredible. Wonderful. Oh, that's amazing. To, that's yeah. Did your children read your book? <laughs> <laughs> they they have read all my books, and it's funny because my children who have their own babies now, well, well, obviously I speak to them all the time, and they'll call me and say I have a question, and I'll be like, but it's on page two hundred in in the book, and they're like, it's much easier to uh, to ask you the question. So, um, but they're but they're great, and and um, I, I think it's helpful for them knowing they know that I'm up to date on everything, and and actually I tell parents to 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 gift bite-sized parenting to their parents because it's an easy to read mm. book and um, this way grandparents can feel more involved because they know what because the, they're not doing the research they, they don't have little babies they don't need to know what the latest uh, recommendations are for play or for development or for feeding or for sleep and this way if they have a little uh, a book that explains to them in simple language what what this generation of parents are doing then it, it allows for those conversations to be more natural and less adversarial. I have a nine-month-old daughter, which I mentioned earlier. So as a father of nine, uh, as a father of a nine-month-old myself now, I'm curious: Do you find parents struggle? What do you find parents struggle with most around this age? And what advice do you have for that problem? So, so parents will struggle at every age because you know, little kids, little problems; big day. kids, big problems. <laughs> right? There's there's always something to struggle with, to have to be challenged by, to worry about. That's just the nature of parenting. And, and I was just telling a, a friend of mine who is about to become a grandparent that when you're a parent, you're always worried about your kids. When you're a grandparent, you start worrying about even more people. So the worrying and the challenges um, and the struggles never stop. So nine month old is such a magical age. Um, and, and, and yet, it's also very similar to all the other ages, because think about what most parents struggle with, let's say, throughout that whole first year, first or second year. They're struggling with the essentials. It's actually um, what I call the, the big three uh, that I wrote about in Bite Size Parenting. It's um, feeding or, or and eating, um, sleeping, and then development. These are the big topics that parents are going to be thinking about or wondering about every month. And mm -hmm. so um, it's no different at nine months. So nine months, there's going to be questions about sleep. There'll be sleep regressions, let's say. There'll be, am I ready to transition my, or is my baby ready to transition from three naps to two naps? What does mm -hmm. the schedule look like? Those are going to be your sleep challenges or, or struggles. With feeding, if you haven't yet introduced uh, finger foods, that's the time to be doing it, if, if not earlier. Um, but you're going to be seeing in your child who's starting to become a little more independent, Food preferences show up. You're gonna. There's gonna be a little more, uh, or or less amen. Your child will be a little less amenable to new foods. So there's that feeding uh, struggles that you might be having. Um, I think one of the most magical parts of a nine month old is the activity level because it used to be that you could plop a child down on the floor even if they're sitting, and then that's it. They they won't move. But now at nine month old, most babies are already crawling or pulling up to stand in the next month or two. And so, you know, you're going to have wiggling at that at, at when diaper changes are happening. You're going to have struggles when your baby is being strapped into the car seat. Um, and it's something to, for parents of nine month old to really focus on is to remember, well, all this activity means that my baby is no longer sedentary. I need to be right. baby proofing. And so that's mm. probably, I would say, um, the foremost uh, in your mind at this age. Is, is your baby crawling? She's crawling. She's growing everywhere. She's, can, she's st using anything she can to walk around. Uh, it's it's inc it's it's funny because we and we talk about this often. It's uh, you know as a new parent, uh, uh, you first think that the first three months are the hard. It's it's super hard, <laughs> and it's, it's 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 always funny because the more you go on, it, you're just presented with new challenges, and then you look back in hindsight and you said, 
are you kidding me? The first three months were easy. I mean, they, you know, you could put her anywhere and she wouldn't move. I mean, she can't move. She can't even, you know, go on her, uh, on her tummy. And now I can't keep and keep, you know, I can't, if, if she's in the room with me, I need to make sure I'm watching her at all times because she will find something to eat. Even if the carpet, even if the floor is vacuumed on a daily basis, magical items appear all the time. So it's like 10 different times a day, you know, and, 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 and I'm saying this, but I, I don't know what's going to happen when she starts to really walk and, you know, unassisted. And I'll probably come back here and say, oh, man, I thought. I actually had it easy at a nine-month-old as opposed to, I don't know, 14 months. A hundred percent. That That is a journey. And every that's what's so beautiful and magical about watching a child grow because every month um, presents new experiences and challenges. And yeah, what seems unsurmountable because it seems so difficult at that particular moment, when you get to the next stage and then you look back, you're like, oh, OK, I got through that. I, you know, this now, but now it's really hard. Um, and then, you know, and then then she'll be a teenager one day. So then we could have a chat. <laughs> Another thing is that when you're going to have second child, it's going to be much easier because you over protecting and overthinking with the first one. And with the third one is even more easier. You are not you are relaxed. Other two is watching the third one. You're just <laughs> watching TV or something like that. <laughs> okay, so let me in this case ask the parenting expert, Sharon. My wife already wants a second uh, child. Uh, she's been asked. Uh, she, she's been ready for months now. <laughs> so my question to you is: How do you know when you're ready for a second? I know it's an unfair question, obviously, but how do you know when to have your second child? I mean. <laughs> I wish I had an answer for you, but I don't. I mean, there there are there are recommendations in ter- from a health perspective of how what what the spacing should be. Um, I, I think it's like eighteen months uh, mm. before you get pregnant with the next one. But um, most, if you're healthy um, and it, it doesn't really matter, you can have babies closer in age. Certainly, um, I did. Um, my first two are are twenty months apart, and then I took a break, wow. and then my second two are twenty two months apart. So, um, so they're, they're, they're very close in age, but um, in a wonderful way. So there's no right or wrong when it comes to this. It's about what you feel you're able to do emotionally, physically, financially. Um, there are benefits to, to a, a really short span uh, between children, and there's a benefit to a longer span. It really, it really is about that gut feeling. You said your wife is, mm. is saying she's ready. Maybe that means that, you know, you guys are ready. It's, it's, <laughs> It, it will be very key, hard. You heard the key word, Vlad, right? Yeah. Said, your, your wife, wife is, is ready. ready. You are, that means you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> I said, perhaps, maybe it means you're ready. Okay, we so, got the message. She might be able to convince you. <laughs> <laughs> Fair <funny>. enough. <laughs> um, Sharon, I have another uh, research here by Pew Research Center. So their survey highlighted that some interesting and scary potential concerns and they found that 40% of U.S. parents with children under 18 are extremely or very worried about their children potentially struggling with anxiety or depression. And this concern about mental uh, health actually topped the list uh, of parental worries, even surpassing the traditional concerns like bullying, uh, physical threats, substance abuse, uh, teen pregnancy, and trouble with law enforcement. So my first question to you would be, you as a mom of four, is that concerns you? So, you know, youth mental health issues have reached uh, um, a crisis level, and that's not my opinion. That's according to the U.S. Surgeon General. There was a very fascinating study that um, uh, that I, I actually gave a talk on this topic um, a few months ago, and um, there's, there's a study that I found from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It was published in JAMA Pediatrics. And the study found that between 2016 and 2020, the number of children ages 3 to 17 who were diagnosed with anxiety increased by 29%, which is a huge, huge increase. And I want to point out that this study looked at data only until 2020. So that was before the pandemic. And we know both anecdotally and with other research that during the pandemic, anxiety and other mental health um, issues increased even more. So um, it's, it's, am I worried about it? Yes, there is certainly um, a, a significant um, rise in mental health issues that so much so that actually the, um, 
the U.S. Prevented, what, uh, the US Preventative Services Task Force now recommends that all children over the age of eight have annual screenings for anxiety wow. um, and under other mental health issues. So we are definitely here in the United States um, seeing, uh, and, and probably around the world, but certainly here in the U.S., that's what I, uh, I could speak to, um, are seeing an increase in, um, in anxiety. I, I will say this, though. I, I'm, you know, first of all, as a parent, we're always worried, right? We're always worried about our own children. My focus and my expertise really is in young kids, in preschoolers and younger. Um, so it's slightly less of an issue, not because right. um, mental health issues can't crop up um, and not that we shouldn't be on the lookout for it. But most children in this age group and the preschool and younger age group are going to exhibit normal behaviors that sometimes can get parents worried. They'll tantrum. They'll be defiant. They'll be hyperactive. Um, they'll be sad. They'll be shy. And these are all normal toddler behaviors. But sometimes as parents, because we're hearing about this increase in anxiety and increase in all these other um, mental health issues, we might say, oh, my gosh, my, my child is tantruming so much, right, so much. Um, does that mean that he or she will have the oppositional uh, disorder or d oppositional defiance disorder? My kid is so hyperactive, he's jumping off the walls. Does that mean he has ADHD? My child is so shy and reluctant and clingy and reluctant to go to other people. Does that mean that she has anxiety? My toddler is really sad. Does that mean that he has depression? A and the truth is, is that most of the time, these behaviors are completely normal and expected. We, um, so, you know, we have to remind ourselves that just because we see these behaviors doesn't mean that this is equal to or indicative of a real mental health issue, right? Because toddlers and preschoolers are just learning how to navigate these feelings. They're learning how right. to deal with sadness and frustration and um, shyness and, and socialization. And so if we jump to the conclusion of, oh, my gosh, this must mean that my child has a mental health issue, then we might uh, be doing a disservice because um, it, it can turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy. That said, and I want to be very clear, that said, there are signs that you can see very early on. And if you as a parent are seeing um, behaviors in your child that exceed the norm, that are different from what we're seeing in our other children or other children in school or on the playground, and we are worried and our gut is saying there's something here, trust your gut and make sure to bring it up with the pediatrician because the pediatrician can um, screen for it, even in preschool age or younger, mm. can um, refer you to uh, the appropriate uh, specialists, you know, mental health counselors, psychologists, things like that. And this goes for both mental um, health, uh, emotional issues, as well as physical, right? I always tell parents, trust your gut if your child doesn't seem to be developing physically in, in the way that is the norm. But um, early intervention and all these things, physical, emotional, can really make a world of difference when it comes to helping your child um, if, if there, if they are going down that road of um, anxiety, depression, other mental health issues. You mentioned that from 2018 to 2020, there was a significant increase. Do you know why this increase was happening? So th there's actually lots of theories, um, uh, and, and it's probably multifactorial. There's not going to be one reason for why anxiety in particular is increasing. Um, we could point to social media. We can point to electronics in general. We can point to the pandemic, which also obviously created um, a, a hyper sense of anxiety among everybody. We could point to parental anxiety. We're seeing among young adults and uh, adults even under 30, their increased levels of anxiety are increasing tremendously. And so um, the more uh, levels of anxiety that a parent has, uh, the, the more likely it is that a child will have anxiety, both from a genetic perspective, but also because a, a parent who is very anxious will sort of uh, project their anxiety onto their child, creating more anxiety. Um, there is actually uh, um, uh, another cause that's, that's being bandied about as a very significant cause of anxiety, and that's overprotectiveness, hovering helicopter parenting, um, there uh, mm. and this lack of uh, independence uh, that parents are so overprotective that 
that they are not giving their children independence. And um, there's so much research that's been coming out lately over the last five five years in particular that is showing particularly that overprotectiveness, um, the lack of independence that young children have today, the lack of free playtime or just free time to be a kid um, is, is contributing to this increase in anxiety, um, to risk aversion, to um, dependency on the parents, to fear, to uh, lack of strong coping mechanisms. And so that's, that's probably one of the, uh, again, that's multifactorial, but that's a big one. I actually have another question about uh, parenting here, which is gentle parenting. <laughs> and could you please explain to me, because I also don't understand what gentle parenting is and for all our listeners. Sure. So gentle parenting is like the, um, the buzzword these days when it comes to parents. If you've ever been on social media, um, you know, you hearing it all the time. I think the, um, the hashtag gentle parenting has like over 3 billion views on, um, mm -hmm. on TikTok. So it is the, it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, no, but you've heard it. You've heard it, so you don't okay, know what well, it I'll is, but you've you. heard it. Um, it, it what's interesting is that gen this, this notion of gentle parenting has actually been around since the 1930s. It's not something new. It's just gotten a lot of traction now. Um, and and you, you asked, what does gentle parenting mean? There There is actually no exact definition of gentle parenting mm. because it's not a term that's in the, the literature. It's not a term that's... Um, studied by researchers. It's not a term that psychologists use, but parenting experts do use it. And um, the basic conceptualization of gentle parenting are things that most parents have been doing for a long time, um, and, but there's more emphasis on it now, and, and, and that's why it's under this rubric of gentle parenting. So things like respecting the child, um, validating your child, empathizing with their emotions, giving your child positive uh, feedback, positive reinforcement, really helping the child process their emotion. Um, and then for the, so that's for the child, for the parent to do for the child. And for the parent to be a gentle parent means that you have to be really calm in the face of chaos. A and what the theory of gentle parenting is that when a child is gently parented, that they learn to recognize and control their emotions. And so, um, and the reason why they're eight and therefore the behavior is better because they're constantly being affirmed by their caregiver. They're constantly being told your emotions and your feelings are real and important. So that's the, the, the theory of gentle parenting. Um, and what's interesting about gentle parenting is that there's actually a lot of backlash against it now because for parents who are really trying to adhere religiously to this philosophy of gentle parenting, it, first of all, doesn't always work for all kids and all situations and all behaviors. Um, second, it's, um, it's, it's, it's exhausting for parents to constantly be attending to their child's every whim and every emotion. And what some experts are seeing is that when you go too deep in on gentle parenting, um, the, the, the script is being flipped and the, the children who end up being in control and the parents mm -hmm. are like kind of floundering. Um, there was a survey of, of parents who consider themselves adherents, really strict adherents to gentle parenting. And they, they um, were asked, what, what is your most, uh, what's your biggest challenge? And across the board, the word that everyone used was overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed mm -hmm. because I'm constantly trying to stay calm when I can't stay calm all the time because I'm human. I'm constantly trying to dig deep and to figure out what my child's feeling right now. And, and you know, oh, you don't want to put your socks on. You must be very sad about having to put your socks on. But sometimes your child just needs to get those socks on because you need to get out the door. So it doesn't feel always so realistic. So what, um, what I always say as a parenting expert is that... Um, trying to adhere to one and only one type of parenting technique is likely not going to work. It will work sometimes. And I think gentle parenting is wonderful. And I incorporate it into all my um, advice. Um, and when I do coaching with parents, it's, you know, it's, I, I incorporate that into my strategies. But um, so gentle parenting can work, but it's not the uh, end all and be all. And it shouldn't be used, I think, exclusively. So um, what we do have is that we have a lot of research telling us the best type of parenting technique, and that's authoritative parenting. 
which actually okay. incorporates a lot of the gentle parenting techniques because authoritative parenting is very warm and nurturing and acknowledging of feelings. And it doesn't stop there. It also has very um, strong limits and boundaries that are set by the parents and that gives a structure to the parent-child relationship, the interactions that a child will have day to day, and that it creates um, a sense of, of um, security for that child because there are these boundaries and limits. And so there's lots of wonderful authoritative parenting techniques that I encourage parents to use that it, it is not just because I'm making it up. These are um, techniques that have been shown study after study after study that um, really, really work to, to, um, to get compliance, but more than that, to create a beautiful relationship between parent and child and to allow a child to develop emotionally, um, regulate his or her emotions, and, um, uh, and, and become a, uh, you know, a, a, a kid who really understands how to behave, how to uh, understand what it means to be social, what it means to, to interact with other children, what it means to be part of a community in school, and, and, and so on. But with the gentle parenting, you said one of the ways is to, for, for parents to basically don't show their emotion. Wouldn't it hurt no. the kids as well because they're suppressing their emotions? Sometimes parents will take this, this notion of gentle parenting too far and not understand the, the purpose of it. So it's not about hiding your emotion. It's about staying calm, mm. but not about hiding the emotion. But, but what you brought up is, is a great example of why gentle parenting isn't the end-all and be-all. Because what's so important for a child to see is how a parent has emotions well. and how they respond to it. Because modeling is going to be your biggest tool, your strongest tool in your parenting arsenal to be able to say, well, I'm really angry right now, but I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to calm down and I'm going to whatever it is that you have to do as a parent that you, to regulate your own emotions. And it's a great teaching tool for a child to see, oh, wow, mommy or daddy was really sad about something and they cried and then they felt better and whatever, right? Or they were angry or they were frustrated and then they did this or they problem solved or they figured out a different way. These are very important tools. So, yes, if you are taking gentle parenting to the extreme and you're always presenting this, uh, this, this very uh, emotionless persona of, okay, you're sad, yeah. but you, you know, whatever it is, that's not, that, is, that, is, that isn't healthy for a child. A, a child should see a range of emotion and should see your healthy coping mechanisms. You should not try to be your child's best friend as a, as when they're young, right? You want that authoritative stance point relationship, those, those boundaries. Uh, am I correct or do I have that wrong? I mean, it should be the balance of everything. Obviously I'm on Reddit every night because I always have some parenting question and there seems to be a common trend where some people are like, well, you know, my child's my best friend, but like, you know, with best friends, you don't really set strict boundaries or, or things like that. So I'm, I'm just trying to really understand more of a clear picture of the authoritative uh, parenting style. So uh, Vlad just said it, right? That it's about balance. So okay. you want to have a relationship with your child where there's mutual respect and friendship. Um, mm. But it can't end there because ultimately you are still the parent and your child is still the child. And presumably you know more and presumably you know how to keep your child safe. And presumably you want to teach your child certain things. And so a mm. best friend doesn't take that role on, as you just described. Um, so it's about balance, friendly, warmth, caring, nurturing. Those are all important things, whether you're uh, uh, ascribing to the gentle parenting technique or the authoritative parenting technique, which incorporates gentle parenting techniques. But ultimately, yes, you are the authority figure in, the, in, in that relationship. And it's not about exerting your authority because you're controlling your child. It's about teaching your child. I always remind parents that the word discipline doesn't mean punish um, or control. Mm. It means it's from the Latin and it means to teach. And so your role as a parent is as a teacher. So teachers, if they're good teachers, are warm and caring and friendly. And you can have a really close relationship with a teacher. But there's still this understanding that my teacher is helping me do things that maybe I'm not capable of doing yet or that I'm still learning. And that's what right. a parent uh, relationship should be. 
So having mm-hmm. those those boundaries and those limits are very important, and it's both big and small. I mean, you know, when, when we talk about authoritative parenting techniques, we talk about things like consequences, right? Now, consequences are not punishments because, again, discipline is not about punishment, but it's about logical consequences. Everything in life has a consequence, right? As adults, we do, we, right. we speed, we get a ticket. That's a consequence. Right. We, and we learn from that. So if a child starts to throw a toy, we can be a gentle parent and say, you must be really frustrated and that's why you threw the toy. That's the gentle, that's the empathizing, that's the validating the emotion. But if we stop there, what are we teaching? So the next right. step in authoritative parenting is to say, but toys are not for throwing, toys are for playing. And because you threw this toy, I'm going to have to take this toy away. Tomorrow mm-hmm. you'll be able to play with it. Right? So mm-hmm. that's a consequence. That's a great technique. Right balancing that friendship and that empathy and that warmth with the limit and the boundary. Um, and there's other techniques about um, w- with authoritative parenting. It's, it's um, like a, a positive uh, attention. You know, sometimes with gentle parenting, because we spend so much time validating the behavior or the big emotion, we sometimes end up giving, parents will sometimes end up giving more attention when a child is exhibiting um, mm-hmm. negative behavior than positive right. behavior. And right. we don't even, right, parents who are doing this gentle parenting all the time don't even realize that. But your child is whining and all of a sudden you spent 20 minutes, oh, you're whining and you, right. it's because you probably are so sick, right? As opposed <laughs> to saying, no, I'm going to give you the attention when you do positive behavior. I'm so proud that you stopped whining or I'm so proud that you're talking to me in, in, a, in a nice voice. That's a positive behavior. And the more you reinforce positive behavior through your positive attention, the better behaved your child or the better regulated the child will be. Um, so it's okay to ignore whining if you're, or if your child is asking you the same thing when you've already said no. It's okay to ignore that. Remember, we're ignoring the behavior, not the child. So if your child is just whining to get attention, it's okay to say, I know that you're sad, but I'm not going to be able to listen to you when you have that voice. And then you mm-hmm. ignore the child until the child responds or acts in the way that you want them to. Thank you so much for asking me that in a nice voice. It's still gentle and it's still wonderful, but there are limits. There are boundaries. Right. There are rules. Yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah, people just in general are negative. They always pay attention more to negativity than positivity. It's not only in parenting. It's true. It's in life everywhere. <laughs> Even when we do ourselves, true. we trying to kill ourselves for something that we did wrong. But when we do something nice, we are not praising ourselves and not thinking of ourselves nicely. A hundred percent, right? We don't give, it, we don't give ourselves enough self-love, right? And, and we, we are enough no, grace. I wonder and, why and... we have more negativities and positivity in our minds. I mean, this is the biggest question. I, I, I'm, I'm fighting with my, with my kids and, and wife every day. I'm saying, forget all negativity, just stay positive even if something is wrong something happened bad you fail this and that it's okay good thing will happen Maybe or, or you could spin it you could spin even that bad failure into something positive yeah. oh you failed but look you you, you, you let's figure out a way right you've learned let's figure out a way how next time you do this or next time you're in this situation you can do something differently so that you won't fail or that the outcome will be a little different perhaps better but Vlad, talking about bad things is so entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> talking about gossip is entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, Whining uh, um, is always I'm, entertaining, of course. Yeah, well, I mean, think about it, right? When you're with your group of friends, what do you talk about? Uh, most, most people don't usually talk about positive things. I wonder why that is. I uh, wonder why that, because that's, that's I'm trying common. to remove this kind of circle. Well, <laughs> well, Sharon, I was looking at your Instagram earlier and something caught my attention. Uh, you had a picture up and you mentioned uh, that if your toddler is a picky eater, you mentioned that you should not be praising them or even commenting on anything when they eat. Uh, so I had a quick question on this. Uh, if your toddler is not picky, so for example, my, my child is not a picky eater, but I find myself you know, praising them all the time for every little thing they do, including when they eat the p- piece of broccoli. Is that a bad, th- should I stop doing that? It's a great question. Um, the idea, and this particular uh, post that you're referring to was about picky eating, picky eaters. Most toddlers, by the way, are not, or, and preschoolers are not picky eaters. Hmm. Most toddlers are just toddlers. Um, and so okay. a lot of the, the um, the, the behaviors that we associate with picky eating is not, by definition, picky eating, but, but we'll just 
go with that. But in general, we don't want to be putting any type of pressure on our kids when they are eating, um, because then it becomes a power struggle. If we are uh, um, putting any type of pressure on our children to eat, then our, our, our kids may start to refuse food, because not because they're not hungry, or not because they don't want the food, but because they want to exert control over us as parents. And so the key here is about pressure. So praising that is for positive uh, encouragement is fine. But a lot of times praising kind of is, or pressure is disguised as praise. So, um, you know, it's mm-hmm. okay to say to your child, oh, wow, you ate that broccoli so nicely. Or I love that you just tried that carrot for the first time. That's praise. That's actually praise. But if you are applying mm-hmm. pressure, but kind of disguising it in a praise, I'd be so happy if you finished your whole plate, or I am so happy that you finished your whole plate. That's praise for pressure. That's pressuring the child to finish their whole plate. And, and what happens there is we're conditioning the praise or the reward on your child finishing the plate. So that is, um, as opposed to eating for the sake of eating, for the sake of appetite, which is what we want to be encouraging. So I, I remind parents to, it, to, to sort of examine what their praise is. <clears throat> if the praise is to fulfill their own need, a parent's own need for, oh, my kid is eating neatly because I want them to eat neatly, right? It doesn't matter when a toddler is eating messily. They'll learn eventually. Like, just don't get stressed about the messy eating. But if I'm praising them for eating neatly, is that about them and their eating habits? Or is that about my need for, um, for the meal to be perfectly neat? If I'm praising them because um, they're trying one more bite, that's trying to control their appetite. So that's pressure, not praise. So uh, it's, a, it's a distinction, but it's an important distinction. Yeah, that's, that's a very good... So I, I have some work to do because I definitely... Um, you know, that, that it's, I'm not praising for the right reasons because that is uh, pressure disguised as praise, you know, because my next objective is to get them to have another piece of broccoli and another piece of broccoli. So this is great. This, this is fantastic. I have one more, one more question to you. What advice would you give to that young Sharon, which was giving birth to her first child? What advice? I, I, I think, and, and we sort of talked about it a little bit uh, today, that it is hard work to be a parent. And when your kids are young, it is exhausting. It's physically exhausting. As your kids get older, it becomes emotionally exhausting. It is really hard. Um, I think that you know now that I have raised my children, they're young adults, um, they're starting to raise their own children. I, I think what is helpful for me and what I like to tell um, parents who are just starting out is that all the hard work that you're putting in now is really going to pay off. Um, one of the most rewarding things that I found as a parent, and I love being a parent. I've been in this business as a parenting expert and author for um, over 25 years. So I love this, these topics, talking to parents, parenting babies. I love it all. But there's nothing more rewarding than seeing those babies turn into toddlers, turn into preschoolers, turn into school age kids, turn into teenagers, turn into college kids, turn into young adults, turn into functioning adults with their own jobs and their own homes. That is like where you see, wow, all my Mm. hard work, all those dirty diapers, all those sleepless nights have paid off. And now I'm reaping the rewards. So um, I, I, I use it as an encouragement back to my younger self, but also to 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 parents like you who are are in the throes of parenting young kids, um, that, that you will reap the rewards both every single day if you're able to take a step back, but also down the road. Sharon, we have a, uh, a tradition here now in our podcast at the end, very end, and uh, the, the tradition is as followed. We always, asks our, uh, we always ask our previous podcast guest any question they would like to ask the next guest so we have a question from uh Irwin, uh, Irwin who is, uh, who is a, a fantastic individual who used to work uh, uh for the New York Knicks and his question to you uh, is going to be what is the most embarrassing event you've experienced and what did you do afterward you can take some time to think about it <laughs> most embarrassing 
as a parent or, or as a parenting the, I, I, expert? I, it's, a, it's a general. So he had no idea about who the next guest is. So it's kind of, you know, it could be any question and you'll have a chance to ambush our next guest. Uh, so it can, I, I, I suppose you can take it the parenting way or it doesn't have to be parent. It's just, it's a general question. What is one of the most embar- embarrassing events that you remember? <laughs> and what did you do afterwards? <laughs> Gosh. I've never been asked that question, and I've been asked a lot of questions. <laughs> I, I, nothing comes to mind except for some reason this story when I was eight years old comes to mind, and I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know what this says about me. But um, I remember I was in, so eight, what was I? I was in second or third grade. I was doing an after-school activity. It was actually um, flute. I was doing flute lessons. And I was in the school building in a group of four or five kids, And um, I was playing, you know, my little notes on the flute and the um, fire alarm went off in the building. And I remember, I guess this is an embarrassment of an eight-year-old, but I remember jumping up and starting to run to the nearest exit, which is probably not what an eight-year-old should do, should wait for the teacher, etc. And the teacher said to me, Sharon, you know, just calm down. It's okay. We will all get out of the building in time. And it wasn't an embarrassing moment, but I remember feeling extremely embarrassed. And I still remember it to this day, many, many decades later, um, about how embarrassed I felt. But it, the, maybe the reason why I thought about this story is sort of what we were, it, we, it alludes to what we were talking about before, about the mistakes that we make as kids or that we make as parents that our kids see are good lessons. So what I remembered from that uh, experience an embarrassing moment as an eight-year-old was to um, to not just knee-jerk react right away, but to maybe take a take a moment to assess the situation, to look at what's going on around me, and then make a more informed decision. So um, maybe that's what led me down my uh, career path <laughs> of, of researching and 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 writing um, and offering informed uh, strategies for parents. But good question. Wow, you learned something about me that I don't think I've ever told anybody. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for sharing that story. And I, sh- I suppose I should thank our uh, our last podcast guest. But now, Sharon, this is your chance to ask any question in the world. There are no limits to what qu- kind of question you can ask them. Uh, please, for our next guest, what question would you like us to ask them? And you're not going to give me a clue as to who that next guest is? No, it's just no. You would think that I would have a, a wealth of questions at my fingertips because I'm a journalist by trade and this is what I do. We were talking about being positive and seeing the positive and so that question was, was, wasn't so positive. So I'll ask a positive question. What is the one small thing that has been your biggest triumph? So not your biggest triumph, but, but the small thing that turned into um, what you would consider your biggest triumph. I love that question. Sharon, it was an absolute pleasure getting to speak with you. Once again, it's it's always a pleasure getting to speak. It, this, this hour flew by really quick, and we learned so much. Sharon, uh, please let us know or let our audience know where they can find you. Anything new or exciting that you have, uh, please uh, do tell. So you can find me on my website, SharonMazel.com, on my Instagram, at SharonMazel. Um, you can find me in bookstores with my book, Bite Size Parenting. Um, on Amazon, anywhere books are sold. And um, I love uh, doing my parenting coaching because then I get to not just um, interact on social media with parents, but one-on-one. And so that's always fun. Um, And that's where you can find me. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you for having me.